First, a message from Pom Pom. Hey Soph, can you help me? I find it so hard to find gifts for crafters, and now I've got zero time for anything to arrive at the post. Oh, well, have no festive fear. Pom Pom have a specially curated selection on their website. They've got special subscriptions and digital options for those last minute Larrys. This sounds too good to be true. Tell me about this subscription. It sounds like it could be a gift for the whole year. You got it, baby. Your loved one could be among the first crafters to receive the magazine every quarter. Each issue is lovingly hand-wrapped in beautiful paper, and you could choose to start with a subscription for the spring issue, right? And make their 2022 a whole year of POM. Wait, that means it would also include the bumper 10th anniversary issue that's due out this summer. What a great idea! And you mentioned something about digital options? Yes, well, any publication you order from Pom Pom includes digital access to the PDF. But what if I told you you could order a gift card that would ping into the recipient's inbox instantly? I'd say you just solved my gift-giving dilemma, Soph. This means they can choose whatever they want. I know, imagine that. Check out these delights and more at pompommag.com forward slash shop. Pompommag.com forward slash shop, you say? I'm going there right now. Great. Now, on to the Pomcast. And welcome to POMCAST, the podcast brought to you by Pom Pom Quarterly. My name is Lydia Gluck and I am here with the wonderful Sophie Heathscott. Hi, Sophie. Hi, how are you? I'm very well. I'm very excited for this uh, festive Ask Me Anything uh, episode of POMCAST. I know. Well, welcome to the last uh, episode of the year. How is it got here already? It's uh, wild. <laughs> <laughs> it is pretty wild, isn't it? The, uh, the years, they just keep coming. They do. Uh, they don't stop coming. Um, so what would you be doing this time when this episode's come out? So right, obviously, the way recording works, we're recording this before it's released. Wow, big reveal there for everyone. <laughs> I don't know if that's how a podcast works. but um, So we're releasing this on the 24th of December, commonly known as Christmas Eve. What do you think you'd be doing around this time? Well... I will be. Um, so I have a, a bit of a tradition with my family um, and I, I grew up in the south of Wales. In case uh, people don't know, I'm from from Wales, from Swansea. And we like to go for a Christmas Eve dip in the sea. Um, and when I say dip, I mean dip. I'm not not really a very cold water uh, swimmer. So it's more of a kind of uh, sort of run around a little bit to warm up, then run into the sea all together. And everybody's going like, whoa. And then you kind of dunk and then run back out of the sea <laughs> and afterwards drink some delicious mulled wine. My auntie is um, Swedish, so she makes some traditional Swedish glug. And then we drink that and try and warm up. And it's, uh, it's a very nice little way to spend some time together. Sometimes we even wear silly Santa hats while we run in the sea. That's great. That sounds uh, bracing, I think the phrase is, I'm going to use rather than freezing. So Bracing is absolutely the correct word. <laughs> Good work. <laughs> How about you, Soph? Um, I will probably be, our tradition is uh, watching Muppet's Christmas Carol. <gasps> great choice. So yeah, I'll be watching Muppet's Christmas Carol with my fam, uh, all being well. And uh, we'll probably have some nice snacks. It's usually a bit of a pre-Christmas Day tradition and uh, yeah just a nice relaxing time that will really be the only thing on the to-do list which I think is a good thing yes minimal to-do lists are ideal over any kind of holiday period aren't they there's a yeah. danger of getting sort of back-to-back -back plans and maybe not having that time to just sit and eat some uh, Christmas snacks <laughs> indeed <laughs> indeed <laughs> Best of snacks. Well, we hope wherever you are and whatever you're doing, uh, all is well with you, whether you're dipping into an ocean or just watching something on telly. So <laughs> it's two ends of the scale. So for this episode, um, it's our Ask Us Anything episode. Um, we're really excited to share this with you. You've sent in questions. We've got some of the POM uh, team to answer them. 
And uh, yeah, I think it's right in saying I'm excited because this is a different sort of new kind of setup for us. Yeah, absolutely. It's the first time we've done an Ask Me Anything on the podcast and we've really enjoyed hearing, I mean, you know, again, don't want to to break the fourth wall here, but we've already listened to a lot of the recordings in preparation for this. And it's been really fun to read and listen to what the uh, Pom Pom team have said in answer to your questions. And of course, Sophie and I will also be answering questions. So it's going to be like a whole smorgasbord of um, exciting Pom Pom Pal answers. Yeah. And I think there's a good mix of questions. So well done, Pom Cats. I think there's a good mix of in-depth, insightful questions and also the more, I'm not going to say frivolous, but fun, uh, lighter questions, maybe. I think there was a good mix. So, um, I mean, where to start? We're going to start with a question from The Love Stitch, who is Tiara on Instagram. And they asked um, about the favourite of the year. So favourite book, favourite pattern, favourite pom-pom issue. And we're going to start with Amy and uh, see what she had to say. Hello, Amy here, Managing Editor. My favourite issue or book from this year is Spring 2021. It came out while I was on maternity leave and it was a lot of fun to receive the issue all wrapped up like I was a subscriber again, having not sneaked a peek at the images. It was a great surprise and I spent many, many nighttime hours whilst on maternity leave dreaming up fun colour combinations for the lovely knits in this issue. Oh, it's so nice to think about Amy on her maternity leave, like, like waiting until until the issue is released properly, so she can relive her her subscriber days. <laughs> pom pom. I think so many, uh, so many other people maybe relate to that if they are subscribers. The magic of uh, a pom issue arriving at your door, all lovingly wrapped. Yeah. Oh, so sweet. All right, we have another pom uh, answering that question. This time, we're going to hear from Sophia. Hi. I'm Sophia and I am Pom Pom's social media and digital content coordinator. And my favourite book from this year, well, it's not a book, actually, it's an issue. Um, It's issue 38, our autumn 2021 collection. And it's my favourite from this year because I want to knit everything from it. There are a few issues that we've published that I am just completely enamoured with. Um, obviously I love all of the issues that we publish. Um, but there are a few like issue, issue 29, for example, and issue 31, where I'm just like bowled over by the designs and the styling and the location. And yeah, issue 38 has, uh, has joined the esteemed ranks of uh, issue 29 and issue 31, uh, in my book. And just the cover cardigan, uh, Sackness that I just thought that was, beautiful and um I've actually just cast on the Sylvatica stole that sort of beautiful um four ply and mohair sort of abstract looking shawl and just everything about issue 38 the gorgeous location of Keswick Mill and you know the styling with with knits and linen together it was just wow chef's kiss I want every pom-pom actually to have the rating of chef's kiss that's the level <laughs> I love that. I love that as like a little seal of approval. Oh my God, I can't wait to see Sophia's um, Sylvatica. All very exciting. I've so enjoyed seeing the colour combinations that people have chosen. Yes, definitely. I think 38 has a um, a place in my heart. I mean, they're all our favourites, of course, but um, we talked about on the podcast, the other episodes, how getting together to do that shoot in person was was a big moment after so long of not being in person in any way and to have that energy of a collaborative uh collaborative photo shoot so yeah definitely oh and yeah and uh Sophia mentioned the linen um beautiful linen clothes that we styled the knits with and they were of course made by um Diva of Phaedra Clothing who is a long time pom-pom favorite and actually lives in Norwich which is where I now live and it was really fun to be able to collaborate with her um now that we've become IRL friends and um yeah just see the gorgeous linen with the gorgeous knits what a great question. Have a little fun trip down memory lane. <laughs> um, so who else we've got? We've got Gail sent us, uh, not a recording, but uh, I was going to say a text message, but that's something different. <laughs> <laughs> she uh, she sent us a little bit of text here. Maybe I'll, I'll intro Gail and you can tell us what favourite uh, issue. I won't try and do her incredible 
Austin accent. I know, I, I won't Sorry, do that. But just, <laughs> just imagine I'm sunshiny Austin Gale. Um, hi, I'm Gale, Pom Pom's US studio manager and knitter of 13 years. I take care of the goings on in the US office and manage the shipments of books, magazines, and any other fun little thing you can find on our website to shops and people in the States. My favorite issue from the last year or so was issue number 34, Autumn 2020, the home issue with guest editor Ocean Rose. It holds a special place in my heart for the soft, intimate collection of patterns, the models, and the moment in history it was released. There are so many cabley knits in this issue to keep you cosy at home during the cold months. Over the last year, I've loved making a wandering flock, rainbow sherbet version of Delphinus and a Valkyrie Fibers dark forest green version of Atlantica. Next on the list are the Nea scarf and crossfade shawl. Gorgeous. Well, thanks, Gail. Via Lydia. <laughs> We'll have photos of Gail's projects on the show notes on the blog because you need to see that Rainbow Sherbet uh, version of her jumper. It's really beautiful. <laughs> you really do. And I love that description of it. Gail always has such a wonderful way with words. Yeah, thanks, Gail. So Lydia, I'm going to throw the question over to you. What's your what's your fave from this past year or so? So as we keep saying, we love all the things we publish. We wouldn't publish them otherwise. But I've chosen... Um, as my favourite, issue number 39, which was our winter issue from this year, from 2021, which was the rhythm issue. So uh, when we sent out the call for submissions, we wanted designers to design knits that were inspired by rhythm in some way. Um, and that was kind of like an open uh, interpretation of rhythm. So it could be very much tied to music or drumming or you know some kind of rhythm that you could dance to. Um, or the kind of more like metaphorical rhythm of a life, for example. And um, we also had the wonderful Lydia Morrow of uh, What Lydia Made is um, her Instagram handle. She uh, directed the shoot and she modelled and I just feel like it was a really, that was a really wonderful collaboration getting to work with her, another Lydia. <laughs> I'm always very pro other Lydia's. But also I am a great lover of music, as many people are, and I just really enjoyed how the uh, concept was interpreted by um, the designers. And there's a lot from that issue that is on my to-knit list, including the cover star, which is Polyrhythm by Johanna Kunin. And I would like to make it in, I think I've already said this, in pink and yellow or pink and green, which are my two main colour combos. So I'm going to go with with that one. How about you, Soph? I think from this year, I'm going to go with a book, Moon and Turtle, which takes so many elements, which I think are so fundamental in good, comfy knitwear. And I think that is a lot of the time that's like ticking a lot of boxes that I'm looking for in making my own clothes. Like I want to have something that's comfy, something that's going to... Um, just I'm always going to want to wear you know and if you're putting the time into making it I think because it also Moontel has so many of those um customizable options as well um I'm thinking especially about the Jinsan cardigan because that's just it looks like a big hug everyone needs more comfy closey clothes definitely especially this time of year that's very true there's also so much lovely color work in that book oh yeah I mean I didn't even start on how much <laughs> I love Cordy which is the front cover with that amazing colorful yoke so um dreamy yeah, very dreamy. All right, speaking of things we love, which is a lot of good vibes in this uh, episode already, um, we have a question from Lemony May, who uh, <laughs> sent us a message via Instagram that uh, I found on their profile. They're called Emily, but I like uh, Lemony May. <laughs> it's a very good name. They asked uh, a project that we loved every stitch of. And uh, first of all, we're going to go back to Sophia to see what she loved. Hi. One project I enjoyed knitting every single second of was Mafadi from issue 31. That's our terrain inspired issue. And Mafadi is by a designer who goes by Bigger Than Life Knits on Instagram. And if you haven't seen it before, Mafadi is this, uh, it's like a, a scarf or a wrap. Uh, it's quite wide. Um, it's two color brioche. So there's sort of like stripes that run either side of a central brioche cable column. That's like sort of the spine of the shawl, if you like. Not only was it one of my first brioche cable projects. So it's sort of representing this, um, 
personal knitting milestone for me. The pattern is so satisfying because what it taught me is that there is uh, very little as satisfying as watching brioche cables grow. <laughs> but it's it's a special uh, project to me in an emotional sense as well, because uh, my friend Sabrina and I had our own mini Mafadi Cal. Um, so we both loved this design from issue 31 and we, we always planned to make it together. Um, so when the time came, I think it was sort of last summer, peak pandemic time, we, um, decided this would be our, um, the thing that was going to bring us joy in, um, in these troubling times. So we helped each other choose the yarn and we cast on at similar times and, uh, shared progress photos. Um, and I hope that in the near future, it will be safe enough for us to meet up and wear our Mafadis together and be Mafadi twins. <laughs> How lovely is that? It gave me all warm, fuzzy feels with a little mini friend, Cal. <laughs> I know, I love that so much. And just to be clear, uh, Cal stands for knit along, um, where people knit a thing at the same time so that they can enjoy the process together. More friend knit alongs in 2022 is what I'm saying. Absolutely. You know what? This has got me thinking about a project that I loved every stitch of, and that was um, Atlantica, which was from issue 34, so that was autumn last year, which Gail was, gave a shout out to earlier. This is by Audrey Borrego, and it is this amazing lace and bobble scenario, and I made it in this beautiful mustard colour, and the dye colour is violent mustard. <laughs> I saw, um, I had the great pleasure and honour of seeing Sophie wear this jumper IRL um, in the pom-pom office while things were um, still safe enough for us to be in there together. And I'm very pleased I got to see it in real life because it really is just the most beautiful jumper. It's like in one of my favourite colours, obviously. So I was bound to think that it was amazing. But also Sophie looks, it just, it looks so good. So beautifully executed and um it really made me think like, oh, I think I need one of those as well. Oh, well, thank you. It was very kind. Yeah, I definitely recommend it. There's a lot of things going on. There's, you know, there's more bobbles, there's a bit of lace, there's sort of a small like twisting cable. But something about the the detail in that stitch, I think sort of similar to what um, Sophia was saying about the brioche that you sort of get in the flow of uh, that, that project. Shall I be Gail? Yeah, I'd love you to be Gail. <laughs> <laughs> so great to get to be Gail sometimes. If only I could really be Gail. So I know, this is interesting, actually, what Gail says in comparison to what we've just said. So I'm Gail. Um, I enjoy so many of the lacy, cable patterns that it surprises me to say the real answer is the James pullover from Knit How. I'm working on my second version for a loved one. It's a straightforward, easy to follow pattern that makes for a gratifying, wearable knit. With mostly stockinette stitch and a waffle stitch yoke, it's a perfect project for in-between more complicated knits and it works as a casual, comfortable sweater that you can work in or it can be dressed up. And I wear mine to the office often. Lovely. Well, there we go. Just as a complicated project can have so much love, uh, well, shout out to the simple ones as well. <laughs> Absolutely. And I um, I also love... Uh, I love to have a combo of, you know, you've got to have your more straightforward knits on the go and then your more complicado ones. Complicado. <laughs> hey, love it. <laughs> <laughs> See. Well, on to the next question. This is actually a question direct to Lydia from mm. Alexandra. And uh, her handle is Alexandra Pui Paula, I'm going to say, which is very fun. So thanks for sending in your question. And they say... To Lydia, I love your style, how it has evolved. How do you pick your outfits in the morning? I was extremely flattered by this question. I um, know, what a nice question. Yeah, thank you, Alexandra. What a lovely, lovely thing to say. I am, um, yeah, very honoured and flattered that you say that you love my style. That's uh, very, very kind. Um, and I've thought about this question a lot since it came in. I mean, I think like most people, my style has evolved quite a lot over the years since I uh, first started choosing my own clothes, which was now quite a long time ago. <laughs> um, but I suppose maybe I'll just start kind of at the beginning of pom-pom times, because that would be the time that other people would be aware of my style. I think that my style has become more comfy 
over <laughs> over the past 10 years. I think I used to wear um, a lot more sort of slightly more restrictive clothes that I really liked. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. I think if you like the way you look and feel in something, then wonderful, wear it. But I have start to prior- started to prioritise um, comfiness. So I think that is one evolution. Um, and it's evolved in that I learned to sew, to do a bit of dressmaking. Probably started that about five years ago. And that's changed the way I dress because it's meant that I can um, make things in exactly the colours I would like them to be, more or less. Um, So it's added kind of a new dimension to my style. And I've started to develop a a sort of almost Steve Jobs style. I mean, I hate to say it, but, you know, he was famous for wearing a sort of uniform. But my version is I like to find a sewing pattern that, um, you know, is the kind of thing that I want to wear, whether it's, you know, trousers or a skirt or a dress or top. Um, and then to make that, you know, make any adjustments I need to make and then to just remake that same thing in various colours. And then um, another thing I like to do is to make matching top and trouser sets so that they can be a jumpsuit, but that I can also wear them separately. When it comes to knitting, again, I think I do as much as I I love trying new things and making new things. I can sometimes get in, in a similar kind of situation where I want to make the same kind of thing in lots of different colours or like lots of different kinds of yarn, um, which is kind of where the Raglan book came from. And, you know, so I'm actually at the moment wearing the cover star from Raglan knit in uh, Ching Fibre's um, Surrey alpaca. And, you know, this particular version of the Raglan has this kind of like dreamy, ethereal feel. But then you can, you know, I've also got one in like a, a really woolly wool. that's almost like I could imagine like a farmer wearing it out in the field um, and so I think that's probably quite a big, uh, has been quite a big influence on my style. And how do I pick my outfits in the morning? Well, <laughs> I have about four outfits just in different colours. So that's kind of how. <laughs> um, as I was thinking about this and I was like, I I don't know, really. I just, I love, now that I have, I'm lucky enough to have lots of clothes in colours that I really enjoy, I guess I... Um, I have colour combinations that I'll go back to again and again. So, you know, probably today, for example, I'm wearing some chartreuse trousers that I made, wearing some pink leggings underneath that I made, and I'm wearing um, my fluffy purple raglan. And this is probably an outfit I've worn several times before. So I would say there's a lot of outfit repetition here. Um, But I just, I tend to go for colours that I find to be very pleasing. Um, And that's like a nice way to start the day be like oh I'll wear the yellow thing with the pink thing again but like that always makes me really happy and I still love that combination um so I hope that that has answered um your question Alexandra the secret is to dress like a cartoon character it kind of is yeah <laughs> just don't be afraid don't be afraid to be a repeater be comfy <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 exactly very interesting all right well uh, we're going to hand over to another POM to answer a question from Kiku Corner via Instagram. And they have asked, can you take us step by step how an issue is made? And so for the answer of this question, we're handing over to Belinda Johnson, who is our marketing and publishing director, who actually was the interviewer on last episode. So uh, here we go, Belinda. This is how you make a magazine. Hi. Belinda here, your favourite publisher and marketing director from Pom Pom. This is a really tough question. I'm going to try and condense the process. We work pretty far in advance, as you'll see. This is the kind of top 10 of how we make Pom Pom Quarterly. Number one, we always start with an issue theme. These are proposed by Lydia and Megan, who are our creative directors. Um, We then open submissions for pattern designs, usually about seven months before the issue goes to print. If you are interested in submitting a design to Pom Pom, please don't forget to join our submissions mailing list. Number two, about a month or so later, we make a decision on the eight patterns, around about eight patterns (laughs) that we'll include in the issue. We try and find a good balance of garments and accessories that build a nice collection on that issue's theme. We then work with the designers and producers on choosing yarns and complementary colours. At this point, we also start commissioning our articles And of course, a delicious recipe that also ties in with the issues theme. Yum, yum. Number three, designers then submit their pattern and sample knit to us. 
Sometimes we also work with extra sample knitters if we need additional pieces, say different colours or, or some with alterations, usually for the photo shoot. Number four, photo shoot time. We tend to share these out across uh, both our locations. So we do some in the UK and some in the US. We find fantastic photographers, models, hair and makeup artists, and they all make up our shoot teams and spend a day or so making those knits shine. While this is going on, we also work with our illustrator, Amy Blackwell, on the schematic drawings that accompany each pattern. Number five, patterns are tech edited by Jemima Bicknor and Laura Chow. Articles, recipes, pattern names and blurbs are submitted and checked over by our copy editor, Annie Prime, and our sensitivity reader, Emmy Ito. Our advertisers also then begin sending in their artwork. That happened, that they come to me, by the way. Um, number six, about a month after the photo shoot, we start layout. We work with a wonderful blessed design and this is when things really start coming together. And to be honest, this is my favorite part of the process. Um, we always have a lot of discussion within the team about covers, fonts, colors, image choices. As you can imagine, there's also a lot of proofing involved, especially with some of that complicated pattern text. Oh, and charts. Number seven, to the printers. Once everything has been checked over at least a million times, we send files to print at Park Communications in London. Proofs arrive usually the next day, or if it's a Friday, they'll come Monday. At the moment, they come to my house. Thanks, lockdown. Um, so I get a big tube uh, delivered to me with some giant mag sections. Uh, unfortunately, the only space I have big enough in the house is my bed. My cat is, also, is always um, super interested in them too. Number eight. As long as everything is A-OK -okay with the proofs, we sign off and the magazine starts getting printed and bound together. Uh, we wait about a week before delivery. And during this time, we'll start preparing everything to open up pre-orders, both for our wonderful stockists and our direct customers. Number nine, the magazine arrives. Yay. A lot of boxes rock up at our offices in both London and Austin. There is nothing better, believe me, than opening up that first box and seeing and smelling a new issue for the first time. And finally, number 10, it's in the world. Probably most important part of all, right? When you guys get to see it and start knitting our wonderful patterns. And it's that easy. That's all you need to do. <laughs> very, very clearly laid out there by Belinda. You can tell she's very good at her job. Yeah. So thanks, Belinda, for giving us a little insight into that. Um, so next question. This came for us via Ravelry. Um, the user, their username is Taxing, also known as Nicola. Uh, interestingly, when I said, Megan, would you like to answer this? And she saw taxing, she thought I'd listed it as a taxing question. But uh, <laughs> Just palming off the taxing questions on Megan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But this is, uh, this is actually, I'd say, uh, quite a, a deep uh, question, something that's really is interesting to think about, which um, was Nicola was asking about the, what do we consider the greatest milestone in the, in the evolution of POM? Uh, so here's to Megan to tell us her thoughts on that. Hi, this is Megan. I am one of the co-founders and creative directors at Pom Pom along with Lydia. And I'm here from Austin, Texas, uh, answering your questions. And uh, there's a big question from Taxing via Ravelry um, who asks, what has felt like your greatest Pom Pom milestone to date? Ah, that's such a big question, um, but it's a fun one. And I did a little thinking about this one, you know, like over the last 10 years, it's been really hard to step back and be like, whoa, we did that um, after something is done because there's always something else that's halfway done that we're like, okay, on to the next thing. But there's a couple of things that come to mind. And the first one is the milestone of hiring our first member of staff other than me and Lydia. And that was Amy. And uh, that was a big deal. And uh, she's still with us. And we are so lucky to have her. I like to tell people that it was her idea <laughs> for us to hire her. And she's been full of good ideas, amazing ideas ever since. Um, one of the best things to ever happen to Pom Pom. So that was a huge milestone. Um, paying someone else's salary. That was huge. Um, and another one that comes to mind is releasing the moon issue of Pom Pom. And, um, when we were making it, it didn't, didn't necessarily feel like it was going, you know, that it was going to be 
any more or less successful than any of our other issues, but it turned out to be this huge, amazing success. And um, from the moment that we released the cover, which had an amazing um, moon motif sweater on the front called Ishelle um, by Kat Clark and modeled by the amazing Diana, who's modeling just uh, took everyone by storm and and kind of enchanted so many people. Um, and it really resonated with a lot of people. And I feel like that was an issue of Pom Pom that kind of uh, represented a lot of like what our business is all about and um, beautiful knitting and and meaningful content. And it resonated with lots of readers too. And um, that was that was just a, a, a huge day for us the day that we released that cover. And uh, it still feels pretty good. So those are my two milestones. Thanks for the question, Taxing. Thanks, Megan. It's so lovely to hear her as part of the podcast again. And yeah, a lovely uh, insight into those milestones. Yeah, that was it's such a such a lovely, interesting question. Yeah, we actually uh, had Gail want to answer this one as well. So uh, I'll be Gail this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so hi, I'm Gail. And she is mentioning issue... 34, uh, the autumn 2020 issue, because as it was released during a global lockdown on the heels of the Black Lives Matter movement, it meant the world to me to work for a company that not only provides quality content, but also names and speaks to important issues in our community and world. So thank you, Gail. And uh, also she mentions the fifth anniversary celebrations we had, Pomfest, which sadly she did not get to attend, but was there in spirit. And she said the accompanying issue, anniversary issue, issue 21, felt like such a celebration and achievement. To succeed as a beautiful, collectible print magazine in a world where print media was fading is something that makes me really proud to work for Pom Pom. The issue was also a double cover, extra pages, extra fun, and complete with gold foil on the cover. (laughs) Oh, as always, Gail is just a ray of sunshine. Yeah. She's the gold foil on the cover. Yes, <laughs> she absolutely is. Oh, thanks so much to Megan and Gail for those. And uh, well, you and I, Sophie, were talking about this before we started recording. This episode's got me more introspective than I expected. <laughs> yeah. But I was um, thinking about making Raglan last year, which um, obviously we know what happened last year, but uh, the beginning of that year and so many projects were put on pause and we had sort of a real sudden shift to our schedule and Raglan was a little bit of a um I don't know a light or something that sort of helped with the steering of these quite uncertain waters that sort of gave me a little bit of um uh focus I guess because a lot of my job is getting parcels to people and getting those to places where we weren't sure of that was happening and places weren't open and it was just so much uncertainty but there was that feeling of especially when it came out we're like right we did this and we all did it remotely you know yeah yeah and you did an incredible job of getting all those things to people and places um in such difficult circumstances as did the entire pom-pom team and the extended pom-pom family you know, the freelancers we work with and, and the other people who helped us create the book. This uh, this recording is really giving me a lot of feels. Like, I'm being like, yeah, everyone we work with is amazing. <laughs> and the people who listen are amazing. <laughs> yeah, and it was, I mean, it was a really special project for me um, because it was something that I had been talking about wanting to make for a while and having the support of the Pom Pom team saying like, yeah, it's a great idea. And everyone kind of pulling together in particularly difficult time. Um, to make this incredible thing come true. And there's, there's no way, obviously, that I would ever be able to make something like that by myself. Uh, it's always very much a team effort. Um, and yeah, I think like you, Soph, it was, I felt like it was really nice to have something to work on, you know, to focus on, and also something that I was working on with the Pom Pom team so that we could all kind of uh, be doing it together. Yeah, very important. Um, yeah, so thanks again, Nicola, for that question. Uh, yeah, getting us all introspective. I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Now, here's a, uh, a fun one. This is, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this username, and then I couldn't find their username on Instagram, but it's E-M-V-I-C-P, so M-V-I-P. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they've asked a great classic question. When did you learn how to knit slash crochet? It is a classic question indeed, and uh, we have some uh, other pom-pom people answers here, um, so we can go back to the wonderful Amy. Amy here. Um, I first started knitting in 2009 and initially I would cast on lots of projects and very rarely finished any of them. Um, I definitely wish that a book like Knit How existed when I first started out Um, and to be honest I am yet to learn to crochet but I'm thinking that maybe a future pom-pom book might be enough to get me hooked. I love it. Amy is... uh already saying some sneaky plans what we've got coming so i love it (laughs) i also love that i feel like um more or less since amy started every new year's we've uh we've said that her new year's resolution will be to learn to crochet but oh for sure she she is waiting for um a certain publication to be realized (laughs) then she'll get hooked hey um and uh you know what we've heard from gail again would you like to be gail this time i would love to be gail okay gail says i started knitting in my mid-20s when i got snowed in with family over one fated christmas holiday trip to new york my cousin and sister taught me to knit that winter i'm so glad to have learned and i haven't stopped knitting in years well that's very true gail (laughs) (laughs) i also love that she started knitting in the snowy winter time Yes, very evocative, very beautiful. Uh, When did you learn? So I learned, um, I mean, my mum taught me when I was very little, but it didn't really kind of stick then. So I learned, um, I really, I think I'll trace it back to um, when I was at university in Manchester. So I would have been about 18 or 19. And I had a housemate who was knitting. And I thought, I would like to do that. And then um, I was home for some holidays soon after uh, I had this thought that I would like to learn to knit. And it was very rainy. I was in Wales. It is often rainy there. So I was inside and I thought, now's the time. And I taught myself to knit from a book. Um, But it wasn't really a learning to knit book. But that's not true. I learned to crochet first. Tried to learn to knit based on this series of thoughts that I have (laughs) explained. (laughs) But knitting, I found quite confusing at first. And this this book that I had had both knitting and crochet. Um, And crochet, I found uh, much easier at first. And that seemed to kind of work for me so I learned to crochet and then later um I did pick up knitting so not too long after that so it's been now a good maybe 14 years or so since I learned how about you Soph I can't remember exactly the moment but I know it must have been around when I was six or seven I'm very fortunate that I have a huge uh matriarch I suppose is that word a matriarchal knitting community that was my my mom and both my grandma's and even patriarchal with the my dad knows how to knit he made himself a Middlesbrough football scarf very famously because uh uh, he wanted that so my nana taught him to knit and I very vividly remember being sat in a chair in the living room in our old house and when I would in those early years of knitting I'd have to imagine myself back in that chair to know what to do to know which hand was where I guess that's the kind of learner I am (laughs) wow that's so interesting uh, so now I don't have to do that. I can just pick it up and go. But um, that's sort of, I'm very fortunate in that knitting's always been sort of in my life as a as a hobby and a pastime. But also I think I also learned how to knit when I started working at a knitting shop because I was a knitter, but I wasn't like capital K knitter, right? You know? I mean, <laughs> same, the, absolutely same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just amazing. I feel so fortunate that I was, you know, in that great melting pool of customers and the staff, you know, the people I worked with, like yourself, like Megan, like Juju, we've had in the podcast, who sort of opened this door to this whole other community. Um, and look where I am now, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, our next question comes from um, Avanalian via Instagram, whose name is Kel. And they have asked, do you guys have any snacking while crafting tricks? And it seems that we all pretty much do. Um, but we'll go first to Gail, who has answered this question. And Sophie, would you like to do the honours and be Gail? 
Okay, I will try and evoke the uh, the entertaining style of this answer. Ha ha! A straw in your drink on the side table? A loungewear that I don't mind wiping my hands on? Just kidding. But I'm not too precious about eating around my knitting. It's going to be washed anyways. And then she says, apple slices are good too. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> She's not wrong. <laughs> Um, we ended up having um, a kind of little staff convo about this question. And I don't think we can quite uh, recapture that. But I feel like there was one thing I remembered in particular from that conversation. Is it really centered around crisps, um, known as chips in the States? And there was a lot of discussion of how to eat crisps without getting sort of crisp flavor dust on your hands. What was the answer? There were various answers. One of them was using chopsticks. Mm -hmm. which is a very smart way to do it. Um, There was talk of um, (laughs) um, snacks that were kind of round, so you could easily sort of shake them out of the packet or into your mouth, I think. Was that the... Alice's was saying, like, yeah, if it's a spherical snack, then you just, you don't need to touch it. You just implement the bag rolling system, just like like a trough, right? You roll that in. (laughs) And that was, I think, Maltesers, which are not crisps, but they are round, um, were uh, mentioned. But I also think that um, we were talking, yeah, crisps with minimal crisp dust. I think you said pretzels. Yeah, I, here's the thing. I don't really snack while I craft. I'm more of a, if I do, then I'm going to have like maybe a biscuit with the hot drink I'm having because I am averse to the sticky paws while crafting. I'm going to take a break and then I'm going to have something. That's just how I roll. I mean, that seems very sensible. And um, I applaud your techniques. I, however, am very much on the snack whilst do things. Um, you know, I like to live dangerously. Will I accidentally tip my bag of what's it's onto my knitting? <laughs> it's not happened yet, but it could. And yeah, what would my main tip be? I mean, often if I'm eating something that's kind of that will get on my hands and maybe be greasy, you know, just a piece of kitchen towel or a napkin and hold it in yeah. that instead. It's old school. Um, but yeah, the, the chopstick crisp technique, that's a good one. Um, and sometimes, so if I do take a little break and <laughs> eat my snack and then wash my hands and go back to making. I wonder if we're even going to get like questions or like answers from the questions that we answered. So it could be an internal loop of feedback on here if people get in touch being like, guys, I can't believe you didn't say dot, dot, dot. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yes. Yes. We would love to hear, um, we would love. I would particularly love to hear about people's snack techniques, actually. <laughs> yeah, I feel there's a whole thing we're missing. All right, but gr- back to the crafting. We actually had a couple of people um, asking about crochet. Um, and this is from via Instagram from Kristen Beisch, I think I'm going to pronounce it that way. Also, this question from Sweet Lorraine. And actually, Amy sort of alluded to this in her question, but uh, we're going to hand over to Megan, who has a little recording about crochet and pom-pom. Hi, this is Megan. Um, We had a couple of questions about crochet patterns. Um, One from Sweet Laureen and one from Kristen Beach. And both were wondering about more crochet um, and whether that could be a special issue or just featuring more crochet patterns generally. And the answer is always yes. Um, we love crochet. I super love crochet. Um, and it's something that we love to feature. We don't get that many crochet submissions. So, um, if you're a crocheter with fabulous crochet ideas, please send them to us. Um, we love publishing patterns and we do have plans for more. So watch this space. Uh, it should be very exciting. Thanks for the question. More crochet is what we say. Nice. <laughs> so we've got uh, a couple of questions left. The next one we have here is via Instagram. The handle is the e-reader from It Follows, whose name is Sarah. And they were asking for advice for people wanting to transition into the yarn emoji space professionally, especially publishing. Um, and we had a similar question from Amelia from Ontario, Canada. And this one was sent via email, which is very exciting. We always love to get email. We love to hear from our POMCATs via any means, but email is a sort of unloved medium, we feel. So if you do want to email us, it's podcast at pompommag.com. And that's exactly what Amelia did. And uh, they asked, um, 
for the last episode of the year, I wanted to ask, do you have any tips for starting to design knitwear? More specifically, say I wanted to design a jumper, do I need to design the construction of it from scratch? Or can I use other patterns for the bare bones of the structure and then modify from there to make my own pattern? Interesting. So I think we're going to go with Megan had some thoughts about uh, transitioning into the knitting emoji space. Uh, (laughs) So we're going to hear from Megan first. Hello, this is Megan uh, answering a question from the e-reader from It Follows. Asking for advice for people wanting to transition into the yarn emoji (laughs) space professionally. Um, So I'm guessing the knitting, crocheting, yarn space, especially publishing. Um, And that's a great question and one that we get asked a lot. My advice would be to figure out what makes you different um, and really run with that, Um, especially if what makes you different fills a gap in the industry. Um, So when we started Pom Pom, there weren't a lot of um, independently published knitting magazines or any that I know of really. And, um, so we wanted to fill that gap and make a magazine that, that was kind of for us and what we liked. And, um, and that turned out to be something that was unique at the time. And, um, and I think that's what fiber industry professionals should really strive to do. Um, because that's what will make you stand out from the crowd. And it will also, I think it also gives you a sense of it not being a competition and it being about um, there being a space for everyone and a space for your own individual strengths and talents. So uh, I hope that helps. Great advice there from Megan. Uh, I'd like to follow that also with, I think this can apply to a lot of things. Don't make the thing that you think people want, like maybe with submissions, don't design the thing that you think is wanted make the thing that you'd be proud to make anyway even if it didn't get accepted as submission yes absolutely i would agree with that and uh yes my very good friend hugh used to always say to me you do you and i think that's a good way to summarize it i think if you can keep it true to your vision um then that's always the best way to do things yeah and good luck sarah if that is something that you are you are doing and uh, all poms Uh, To follow up on the question that Amelia had with designing, I say if you want to design a jumper to publish, I guess construction should be always from scratch. But if you are looking to do something for you, then yeah, taking a pattern, using the bare bones, doing some tweaking for your own personal use. I think Raglan, the book (laughs) Ready, Set, Raglan is a great starting point for that, for sure. And uh, there's lots of different books Some that came to mind was uh, Anne Budd's uh, sweater knitting from the top down and um, a real legend in the knitting world, uh, Elizabeth Zimmerman, who has fantastic guides for designing and a real, if you haven't read any, Elizabeth Zimmerman is a treat because she has a real energy and uh, joy about her, about the whole process of knitting. Absolutely. Yes. So as Sophie says, there's a big difference between, um, you know, modifying a jumper for yourself or maybe for a loved one that won't be for sale but if you are wanting to design like Sophie said there's wonderful books that have been written specifically to aid designers and they would be a great place to start um so good luck with your making Amelia yeah okay we're getting back onto the uh introspective questions this is the one to end actually uh so this one's via Instagram uh the handle is uh Georgia Isabel uh your name is Georgia. How nice to meet you. And they have asked the biggest lesson that you've learned from making pom-pom. So again, with the introspective questions and Sophie, would you do the honours and and be Gail for the last time during this Ask Me Anything? Nice to hear from Gail again, because Gail gave a great answer, which was how truly customisable knitting patterns are. Changing the length, yarn slash colour choice, shape, anything can transform a pattern into something perfect for you. I think this kind of follows on from that question that Amelia had about uh, modifying or designing, but really, I guess, once you've got a few skills under your belt, you really can start making uh, knitting work for you and uh, have those transformations that are in your hands. (laughs) Yes, exactly. And it's really kind of fun to try out different yarn and colour combinations and just, you know, you won't always get exactly what you imagined but that's kind of part of the the fun and alchemy of making things for yourself for sure 
yeah. Have you had any big lessons, Lydia? <laughs> <laughs> so I think at some point uh, during one of her answers, Megan mentioned that we've been making pom-pom. It's now very nearly 10 years. Uh, ten, next year, 2022, will be the uh, official 10-year anniversary of pom-pom, pom-pom publishing. It's hard to think of the very biggest lesson that I've learned in the last 10 years through pom-pom. Um, but it struck me that actually teamwork is probably it. Um, I think that Pom Pom is very much a collaboration. It might have been started by me and Megan, but Pom Pom, as it is now, is a team effort and everybody who works on it is, you know, contributing equally. And it's just such a joy to work with people who I like so much. And I feel very honoured that they want to work on something um, that Megan and I started. And I feel really lucky, actually, to work with such a wonderful team. And that team extends outside of our kind of core staff, because, of course, we have incredible freelancers like our graphic designers and copy editors and sensitivity editors who work on most issues. And then, you know, we have the people we commission, you know, the incredible designers, the people who make the yarns, um, test knitters, people who make things from Pom Pom, people who listen to the podcast. There's just so many people involved in this. And I think that the lesson I've learned is that doing things with other people um, is one of the great joys that life has to offer. It's very powerful. Thank you. <laughs> Fortunately, I was going to make a joke. My answer was always send things via with a tracking number. So, <laughs> I mean, also a very useful life lesson. <laughs> For sure. But um, that was a really lovely note to end on. Thanks, Lydia. Teamwork is nice and good. <laughs> yes, that's, that was my summary on our notes. That's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's good. Um, okay, so that brings us to the end of our first ever Ask Me Anything uh, podcast episode and the last episode that we'll be releasing during the year of 2021. Yeah, thank you for listening. We will have a little break in January, so there won't be any episodes uh, the first month of next year, but our first episode uh, will be the 4th of February and we'll be back then for another season of POM Chats and interviews and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the sense then we hope you have a wonderful uh, festive break and start to your new year and we look forward to bringing you pomcast in february as sophie said take care poms bye, bye. pomcast is produced by lydia glark and sophie heathscott along with the team at pom pom quarterly magazine you can buy your copy of the magazine and subscribe too at our online shop that's pompommag.com forward slash shop Big thanks to Eli Block for creating the original music for this show and for being an essential part in creating this podcast. Thanks as always to Megan Fernandez, co-creator and editor of Pom Pom Quarterly. Thanks to the whole Pom Pom team, many of who you heard during this episode. Thanks guys for getting involved and thanks to those special Pom Cats who sent us questions. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and why not leave a review? We would like five stars. They can be the stars in the night sky over the festive period. Why not? Add those to your review. Um, but of course, you can also send any feedback or ideas to podcast at pompommag.com. And don't forget to keep in touch with us via the podcast group on the Pom Pom Ravelry Forum.